We're talking about uh, a poem from the Veronica series by Erica Hunt called Someone Matching Your Description. There's so much that one could say about this poem. There's so much that I want to say about this poem. But in the interest of making this video shorter rather than longer, I didn't say short, but shorter rather than longer, I think I want to constrain myself to say eight things about the poem, all right? And more or less in order in the sequence. So first, the first line, you wake me up. So we have a you, that would be Veronica. You wake me up, comma, Veronica. So you is Veronica. That means the speaker is not Veronica. Veronica is a third person. Veronica is someone the speaker talks to or knows or has imagined. You wake me up. So Veronica is someone the speaker knows she must listen to. Veronica is someone who can create consciousness, wake me up, uh, in idiomatically. Veronica can wake up the speaker. The speaker, whether it's Erica Hunt or someone else, some other figure, needs to be awakened. I am slapped awake and paperless. So if the speaker is a writer, a poet, let's say Erica Hunt, then the issue is whether the poet speaker will be able to write in response to Veronica as a kind of muse or prompt for writing. But I'm slapped away, but I don't have my paper with me. All right, that's the first point. Second point, a tongue triggered dry. That phrase in the first stanza, a tongue triggered dry. This is, this is typical of Erica Hunt's um, torquing of idioms a la the language poets. Uh, with whom she is an associate and uh, several of whom uh, uh, taught her, trained her when she was in San Francisco, a tongue triggered dry. There's something in there that suggests that the speaker is having trouble with words, that the I is tongue-tied, tongue-twisted, tongue-triggered dry. There's a triggering, as in a trauma, slapped awake, wake me up, a tongue triggered dry, meaning I can't, I, my, I have dry mouth, I can't speak, I'm paperless, I can't. Okay, so there's an issue, and that'll, that'll develop a little further. There's an issue with the, the speaker not being able to get the words out. Okay. Third point I want to make, skipping down a little, there is the image of Jacob wrestling with an angel. I'm not going to do the Wikipedia for you on Jacob wrestling with the angel. I'll leave that to you, but... This turns on I wonder. So listen, when Jacob wrestled with an angel, I wonder who wrestles with me. I really love that because it's as if the relationship between the you, Veronica, to the me who is the poet or speaker is similar to a relationship between Jacob who wrestles with an angel and the I who is the poet wanting to be wrestled with. In a way, in a way, uh, the speaker, Erica Hunt, or the eye of the poem, sees Veronica as someone whom she should wrestle with. Fourth point, to argue reasonable doubt. So reasonable doubt is, of course, a legal standard. Someone matching your description is the title. The title obviously refers to either false accusations uh, it implies uh, profiling. It, impri it, 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 it implies that either Veronica or the speaker or someone like them is being um, mischaracterized to argue reasonable doubt. And in court, if someone matching your description is circumstantial evidence, then reasonable doubt is the standard that gets you off. But here, reasonable is put in quotes, so it's ironic, which means unreasonable. So reasonable doubt is an unreasonable standard. That's what's being said here. Fifth point. At the end of that stanza, the stanza that begins even in parentheses, we get guns. This is pretty straightforward, actually, because obviously guns, false accusations, uh, gun violence, violence done to a community, let's say a black, black community, violence done to a community becomes bitterly ironic if the reasonable standard, seems so reasonable, is applied, and yet people who use gun violence in racist situations 
to express their racist hatred wind up getting off by the court. So what we have what we have is to arguable to argue reasonable doubt when I know they never leave their guns. They leave their guns at home. They never leave their guns. They carry them to churches, bars, and courtrooms. So courtrooms now we're merging the whole question of reasonable doubt, and there are actually people with guns in courtrooms. They carry them in churches, bars, and courtrooms and put scarecrow quotes around the world. Now, scarecrow quotes, of course, refers to the ironizing of a term by putting quotation marks around it. Not to quote someone, but to distance yourself from the word is to use scare quotes. And reasonable doubt was a phrase that was used by this speaker in scare quotes. To argue reasonable doubt when I know they have never, they never leave their guns, they carry them in churches, bars, and courtrooms, and put scare quotes around the world. In effect, they scare us to death. Point six. Remember I told you there were eight points here. Point six. Top of the second page in the selected poems, 153, in the middle of that stanza that begins even in parentheses, the second one of those, they are never mistaken. There are no words for mistake. This follows from those who bring guns into courtrooms and churches and bars, presumably kill people out of hatred, racist hatred. That's the context here. Um, they are never mistaken. They are they, they are acquitted because they they will not confess that it was a mistake. No one will apologize. They are never mistaken. This was not this was not a mistaken situation. There are no words for mistake. Mistake. The language has really failed here. A tongue triggered dry. The speaker has no words. Veronica is waking her up, but she's paperless. So the key issue here is whether she will have words or whether there, were, there are words for mistake because the perpetrator of the mistake is never going to... Remember, we're talking mistaken identity. That's the title of the poem. The perpetrator of the mistake is never going to admit that mistake because there are no words in the official language for mistake. All right, two more points. Point seven. The, uh, the, when the verse continues after the italicized paragraph in prose, we won't be talking about it because I said I was going to limit myself here, we get in the, in the startup of the verse again this phrase, there are no words, there are no words for mistake, no, there are no words. This, for me at least, recalls Amiri Baraka's poem, Incident, and that poem is about violence that is uninterpretable. Someone shoots someone else and the speaker, neither the speaker nor the journalists covering the crime, nor the police, know, uh, know what happened. They can't decipher it. There is a confusion of subject and object in that poem. It's called Incident, Baraka. I highly recommend it. It's almost identical with what, to what the journalist or the speaker or the police say at the end of that poem about a shooting. Uh, there are no words. What they say in that poem is, we have no word. In other words, there is no word. We don't have any follow-up. But it's also a way of Baraka and also Hunt to say the standard vocabulary, just like the legal standard of reasonable doubt, the standard language fails us. There are no words to explain this problem of someone matching your description. Now, my eighth point and final at the, near the very end of the poem, not, not quite to the end, the stanza, the last stanza that begins, know without speaking, say without saying. I want to conclude by saying something about that fabulous phrase, say without saying. I, this seems to me to be Erica Hunt's poetics. Say without saying. Who can say without saying? Well, someone giving testimony to it who is a witness to something that causes trauma, a traumatic witness, can often not convey fully in language, but say what they want to say without standard saying. But I think Hunt's poetics are all about what a poem can do, which in fact is to say without saying. 
it has to be said what's being said in this poem. But obviously there are no words, and the speaker is paperless and tongue-triggered dry, can't get the words out, and I recommend a Veronica poem called Broken English, where the words actually completely fail. But getting back to this poem, say without saying. Know without speaking, say without saying. This is the duende. This is the, this is the thing a poem can do without saying. It can convey without conveying. It doesn't have to use description or denotation. It doesn't use to ha need to have the language of reasonable doubt. Hunt's poetics are pointing to what a poem can do, what a poem in particular can do, as opposed to a newspaper article or a piece of prose description. And it has to be said. It has to be said the way a poem, in fact, says things, which is through indirection, through irony, and through the failure of words, this is a poem ultimately about the failure of our language to account for someone matching your description who winds up being um, dragged into a terrible mistake.